second session. And uh, before we start, just a uh, quick reminder that uh, after this lecture and before the discussion, at the end of the one hour lecture, there is gonna be a group picture. So please don't leave. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the details of how this is gonna happen, but. Hmm? Also for online participants. So somehow all together we will take a picture. And uh, is there anything else to say? So I think we are ready. And uh, so we will continue with the Ifan uh, second uh, lecture about non-invertible symmetries. I should I start the recording? Recording in progress. All right, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, so we'll continue the journey on non-invertible symmetries. Uh, so, so this morning, um, I reviewed for you this uh, notion of the general notion of symmetry as topological operators, and we saw briefly how this, uh, the ordinary symmetries, the social ways continuous groups and discrete groups, fit into this framework. And now we're going to generalize that uh, using this, based on this picture of symmetries as topological operators. And on dimension, so in, uh, topological operators, and in, in the morning we discussed the case when the symmetry associated with a group, and this is defined by a topological operator on the co-dimension one manifold of our space time. We're ready to generalize. Okay. The first generalization that retains the feature of being topological as well as some structure of a group is the notion of uh, P-form symmetry, a high-form symmetry, generally a P-form symmetry. Okay. And this is realized by a higher co-dimension in other words, P co-dimension, uh, actually in my notation, uh, will be the P plus one co-dimension um, Topological defect. Okay. So instead of defining a topological defect defined on the co dimensional manifold, uh, in general, you can have a, a topological defect defined on a higher co dimensional manifold, and they generate the P form symmetry, and the P enters into co dimension in this way. Okay. And the particular example is the one form symmetry. four-dimensional gauge theories. And historically, they're known as center symmetry because the corresponding group coincides with the center of the gauge group, okay? And in this case, P is equal to one, and the generators are two-dimensional topological operators and they are generators, they are the charge, the unitary operators correspond to the one form symmetry. And the operators in the theory that are charged under this uh, one form symmetry are Wilson lines. Okay. This is a kind of a characterizing feature of higher form symmetries is that the charged objects are no longer local operators or particles, but rather are extended objects such as Wilson lines, okay? And if you want to think about uh, dynamical objects in your theory, think about, say, strings, okay? They will be charged under this one form symmetry. This is generalization number one. Another generalization, as you, as you probably already guessed from the title of the lecture, is to consider non-invertible fusion, or non-invertible, which come from general fusion. Okay. So previously, the topological defects, as I said, the symmetry are ca characterized by topological defects 
their fusion and how they act on local operators. How they act on local operators. In this case, it's generalized to the case of how they act on these extended operators. And the fusion previously always takes this form. Okay? They follow some group modification law. Okay? Instead of generalizing on the cold dimension, we can generalize this notion of a fusion product to something more general. So I'll denote two such topological defects by Li and Lj, okay? because I'm staying in two dimension. And the corresponding topological defects are one dimensional, upper representing, represented by these lines. We know uh, these two, two, this two topological lines, because they're topological, looked from far away, they, they look like a single topological object. Okay? And in general, it could be, uh, could, be, could be reducible. So it could be decomposed into a sum of individual uh, topological lines, okay? without assuming there's underlying group associated with these topological defects. Okay? And the point, is, the point that on the right-hand side of this fusion product involves multiple topological defects rather than a single one is a signature of non-invertibility. Okay? So when you talk about group multiplication law, of course, you always only have a single term on the right-hand side. Okay? There's no meaningful decomposition. And as you will see, sorry, this can question? this be viewed as a uh, generalization of the OPE expansion? That's, that's a very good qu uh, question. Uh, indeed, I'll make a comment in relation to the OPE of more general defect in a moment. Yes. Yes. So this is a special case of OPE expansion involving extended objects here, line defects. Yes. Question? Uh, why are there uh, no signatures of the indices i and j on the uh, right hand side? Right. So, uh, so this, uh, this, what k appears here depends on i and j. Okay. So this step implicitly depends on the choice of i and j. But I'm being kind of a schematic here. Later we'll write explicit uh, uh, equation. And in particular, that's a good point. So some of the lines here could be degenerate, in, meaning that uh, I'm summing over, I'm just doing arbitrary decomposition here. So I'm not assuming these are each one, of, each one appearing here is irreducible, for example. So if you write the right-hand side in terms of indecomposable lines, the coefficient may also carry the degeneracy of how, they, how many times they appear. We'll be precise about that later. Okay. Thank you. Here, just a schematic. So uh, uh, the moment you have this non-trivial sum, having more than one term appear on the right-hand side is already a signature of non-invertibility. Sorry? Question? Well, the, the definition of having more than one term needs a definition of some like uh, building block. No, a that's sum right. of lines is a line. No, that's right. That's right. So, <laughs> so, so that's a very good question. So, uh, as we will get to that, from what I've told you here so far, uh, there seems to be uh, there seems to be no kind of a, a physical meaning of how I split the right hand side. Right. Uh, for example, why can't why we just say like uh, when I have a single line as before, why can't I split a single you know, unitary as a half, right? Here is obvious because if you take a half of a unitary, it's not a unitary anymore. Uh, here, we also see that there's a, uh, there's a, a constraint, uh, you know, uh, precisely how to decompose this coming from the locality of the, of the, of the quantum field theory, okay? So you can not arbitrarily scale your line defect. Okay? That's constrained by locality. Okay. All right, so let me now come to this question that was just asked. Uh, in, rela in relation. To a notion of uh, OPE between these extended operators in a more general context. Okay. So indeed, this can be thought of as a special case. of OPE between defects. In this case, I'm focusing on line defects, say in D equal to two. But this is the general notion you can, uh, you can consider in higher dimension. But in general, the OPE of the line defects is much more complicated, okay? For example, just to make connection to exi existing knowledge about defects, let's consider an example of conformal defects. So a large class of 
non-trivial defects are these conformal defects, conformal defect lines. In D equal to two, okay? So these defect lines are, again, uh, kind of denoted by this uh, uh, in the same picture, but let me focus, uh, emphasize this is a conformal defect in general, okay? And it is defined such that uh, the stress sensor, so in general it actually can be an interface, okay? It's defined such that the, the stress sensor on this side satisfy this relation. No, let me think about this, uh, this direction. So this is the Z, this is the Z plane, and um, for convenience, I'm calling this direction the imaginary Z direction, okay. Which is the location of the interface. In general, there's a discontinuity in the stress sensor for a conformal defect, okay? Even for in the same theory, okay? The discontinuity in the stress sensor is captured by what's known as a displacement operator. Which is the operator on the conformal interface, let me call it I. Okay? The special case of topological defect correspond to the case when D is trivial, okay? So the stress sensor is fully continuous across the defect. Now, for the general class of conformal defects, there's this notion of OPE that you can discuss, okay? So I take I1, I2, there are two conformal defects, okay? But and that's kind of the picture that you would want to have also for conformal defects, a similar picture as that. But there's some, uh, there some, some important di uh, differences. For example, even if you take this two to be the, uh, to be the same defect, okay, with opposite orientation, and you expect the identity defect to show up, the trivial line to show up here, okay? But this coefficient would involve divergences uh, in particular from the Casimir energy. So, so considering OPE will be corresponding the limit where you take the two defects close to one another. And you will have this Casimir energy divergence that's proportional to a cosmological constant term integrated over the defect, okay, over the line. And moreover, you have Subleading divergences due to relevant operators on the line, okay, from this fusion product. So it's physically very distinct from what, ha what happens here the moment you have uh, this discontinuity. The discontinuity in the stress sensor is what gives rise to this Casimir energy. which is essentially measuring like the, uh, some kind of imbalance between the stress sensor inside of this region and outside, okay? And because in a non topological case, you have this divergence piece, and there's, so there's, there's, not, there's the structure of this fusion, although you can write it down, but it's much messier, okay? And in some, in some special cases, uh, for example, uh, if your system has supersymmetry, okay? In that case, because of the contribution from bosonic, fermionic degrees freedom, And for supersymmetry line, you can achieve the special case where this Casimir energy piece is the divergence is vanishes, okay? And this is why in supersymmetry theories, it's meaningful to talk about fusions of supersymmetry Wilson lines and so on, and this kind of fusion product is, is well defined, okay? So, sorry. And you may be able to derive similar relations, for example, from localization. 
there is no way to regulate this divergence then. Sorry? There is no way to regulate the, the divergence. Uh, uh, you can, but uh, you know, like if for, for kind of a generic theory, there are many divergences over here for each of these relevant operators. If there's only a single divergence coming from the, you know, the cosmological constant term, then that's more uh, kind of a, uh, it, there, there are ways to deal with, but with face, facing the entire tower of subleading divergences from relevant, relevant operator means dimension smaller than one in this context, okay, on the line. Um, it, there's no obvious way to, uh, to achieve a meaningful answer, okay? Question? Uh, sorry, this might be a naive question, but is this uh, divergence uh, related to both the UV and IS structure of the theory? Because uh, in one case, you're taking delta to zero, which is yes. uh, the short distance structure, but you're also integrating over uh, some non-compact direction, presumably. Right, right. So, so here, uh, you can make it compact, but the divergence stays, it's because hmm. of the limit. Right. So the divergence is mainly uh, UV that's divergence. Right. That's, right. that's right, that's right. Thank you. The cast Okay. So that's a, just a quick comment. All right. So let's uh, fulfill this promise to provide uh, some toy example before we jump into general structure, some toy example for uh, non-invertible symmetries. Okay. The toy example uh, is not going to be the toy example of this inverse symmetry will take take place in a very simple theory, uh, which is the discrete gauge theory. Uh, with gauge group, a discrete group G. Okay. I think so, uh, someone of you already asked me about this uh, during the. Uh, discussion, uh, well, informal discussion. So in this case, uh, there are interesting topological operators, which are uh, extended objects. These are Wilson lines. And these are the Wilson lines that you would have. They are just the uh, analog of the Wilson lines you would have for a continuous gauge theory. Okay? So they are labeled by representations of the corresponding group. In particular, the indecomposable de Wilson lines are labeled by DRAPs of the group, okay? So explicitly, uh, the, you can write them in terms of the exponential of your gauge field over a curve, okay, as follows. Now, in general continuous gauge theory, like in Yamil's theory, this this uh, this uh, uh, this Wilson line would not be a topological object. Okay, that's because uh, the connection in general is not flat. But here it's topological because discrete gauge fields are always flat. Okay, it doesn't support, discrete gauge field cannot support any curvature. As a consequence, this pr provides possible uh, realizations of the topological defect operators that we may interpret as symmetries. Okay? And they claim they're non-invertible, they give rise to non-invertible symmetries. If G is non-abelian, okay? So what is the simplest, there's a question? Yes. Uh, so what happens when the connection is not flat? Ah, so when the connection is not flat, then this Wilson loop is not gonna be a uh, topological defect but they will fall, it can fall into this realm of conformal defects. And as I said before, their fusion in general is much more complicated. 
there are these divergences, and from these divergences, there's the regularization ambiguities. But in special cases, like with supersymmetry, you can still have this uh, well-defined diffusion products when all the lines preserve the same super, uh, supercharges. And how can you assure that in this case you have a flat connection? Oh, uh, it's essentially by construction. If you're talking about discrete gauge field, mm -hmm. uh, there's just no, uh, there's no curvature. Okay? okay, yes. Discrete gauge field backgrounds are classified just by how anomalies. Sorry, uh, just, uh, just by the transition functions. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, what are the connections for a non-abelian discrete group? Uh, so this is the same thing that I, I drew before. The, 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 to specify a gauge field background, uh, equivalent to uh, uh, you know, specifying a gauge connection for a discrete gauge field, is equivalent to decorating your partition function with a network of symmetry defects. Each of them will be labeled by you know, this UG, okay, where G is element of the group. Okay, and they're joined by these topological junctions, which we introduced in the last lecture. So this specify piling of your space time by, uh, by networks like this, specify a particular gauge connection background. And the discrete gauge theory means that you're summing over all these configurations. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't like this notation, uh, well, okay, so this is, this is, I think this is the best I can do for general non-abelian groups. For discrete, uh, discrete abelian group, uh, sometimes you can introduce some kind of Lagrangian multiplier field and write everything in terms of U1 gauge field. But this is the, uh, this, is the this will be the, the what, what we need to do for, uh, for this general uh, non-abelian discrete gauge groups. Okay, so another question? As you also draw in this, uh, in this picture, and as you presented this morning, uh, yes. there are maybe two different points of view on, on fusion, both as uh, picking defect and stacking on the same manifold, yes. or as junction, as you draw That's here. Right. That's right. Is, is it obvious uh, that uh, this is uh, exactly the same thing? And um, I mean, maybe in, in, in for lines, uh, it is almost obvious because uh, um, you can put lines uh, only on trivial manifolds, uh, but in for higher dimensional right. defects, uh, uh, you, you you might put uh, um, your your symmetries on different two-dimensional manifolds, for example. And I don't I don't know uh, how to see that uh, it is the same. Yes, yes, you, you are you 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 caught me. That was correct. So now when I draw this picture, this represents a discrete gauging in two dimension. There's a similar picture, but it's harder to draw. To, for the three-dimensional gauging. In this case, in that case, it will not, the basic junction will not be of this shape, but it will it's similar basic building blocks and similar in higher dimension. Okay, so, but okay. The, the, the two points of view are always the same. Uh, Bo both as, as, as stacking defects and, and with junction are always the same. No, so, so, the, so, so as I said before, uh, you, have the, you have the topological defects and they satisfy some fusion rule. And on top of that, there are these junctions. The existence of junctions can be inferred just from the topological property of the lines, okay? But there are some extra data, which is the, you know, the specifying each junction, okay? And that goes into defining uh, this gauge theory background. The, the key point is that the freedom that you have in defining these junctions uh, would not affect uh, physical quantities like anomalies associated with the corresponding symmetry. So in this case here, for example, I'm talking about the discrete gauge theory, in which case I have dynamically gauged the group. So I'm implicitly already assuming there's no anomaly associated with the symmetry in this setup. Okay. okay. All right. So let's get back to this, uh, this claim. So the simplest, perhaps the simplest example of a non-abelian group uh, is the case when it's the permutation group of three elements. Okay? In this case, uh, we have three irreducible representations. The trivial representation, I'll write it as one. For the moment, uh, for the moment it will become clear why I call it one. And there's an additional uh, one dimensional non trivial representation, that's the sign representation. Okay? And then there's a vector representation, which is the, uh, which is the two dimensional representation for S, S, S3. I'll call, let me call it V. Okay, and as is true for Boson loops in general, 
Okay? You can decompose at the level of the representation, representation data associated with the gate group. We can decompose the fusion product between two Wilson loops into Wilson loops labeled by the representation that appear in the tensor product. Okay? So in particular, the Wilson loop associated with uh, the, the sign representation, when you fuse with itself, you just get an identity. That's because the tensor product of sign representation with itself is an identity representation. Similarly, identity, when you fuse with the sign representation, it does not change representation, and the same is true for the uh, vector representation. Okay? So, so far I'm writing fusion rules where only one term appear on the right-hand side, and that's a signature of so far we're just uncovering some invertible symmetries in the theory. Now, now invertible symmetry will be generated by the Wilson, line, the Wilson loop associated with the vector representation. Now the key is that the tensor product of the two vector representation of S3 decompose into three representations. All these three representations appear in the tensor product. As a consequence, on the right-hand side, you have this combination of Wilson loops appearing. Okay? And this is the non-invertible symmetry that we promised in this very simple toy theory. And um, if, you are, if you are still confused about something that I said before, uh, let me just focus on the case for D group two, and then this is literally the picture that, uh, that, that it means for, you know, this is the literary kind of the network you sum over to de define this uh, discrete gauge theory, okay? But the, this construction, what I was trying to emphasize before is that this construction works in general dimensions, and you always, for any discrete gauge theory in any dimension, you will have this non-invertible symmetries uh, generated by this Wilson lines, okay? As long as the gauge group is uh, non-abelian. When it's abelian, all the reducible representations are one-dimensional, uh, so, and you will not have this non-trivial tensor product that involves more than one term uh, in the decomposition on the right-hand side, okay? And this is, this is a very, very simple uh, model that realizes this symmetry, and it turns out that this symmetry uh, is usually denoted by S3, uh, rep S3, okay? Meaning that the individual generators of the symmetries are one-to-one -one correspondence with representation, irreducible representation of S3, okay? And later we'll see this kind of trivial symmetry will show up in the interesting two-dimensional CFT, namely the three-state path model. So here I discussed the kind of trivial example, a trivial theory where some non-invertible symmetry shows up. But the general lesson is that a given, given non-invertible symmetry can show up in many theories. In particular, we'll see that show up in more interesting theory, the, state, the three state path. Okay. Once we have settled this very simple toy example, let's start with some general uh, generality of um, non-invertible symmetries. To spell out the general structures in more detail. Okay, and once again, uh, I'll be focusing on dimension two, okay? And as I, I've alluded to before, the mathematical structure here, we'll see the mathematical structure here generalize the groups to what's known as the fusion category. and we'll unpack the ingredients that go into this definition step by step. So the basic starting point of defining a non-invertible symmetry in two dimension in general quantum field theory is to first specify the set of topological defect lines. Uh, which we will abbreviate as TDL. And it will denote by Li individually. Okay? And analogous to the fusion rule that we wrote before, and we generalized to the case when there are more terms appearing on the right hand side, this topology defined lines generally satisfy some fusion algebra or fusion ring. 
which tells you how to decompose products of these generators in the fusion product. And when I write the equation like this, it should always be interpreted uh, in this way, okay? So you are taking two, uh, you are taking uh, these topological defect lines to lie on manifolds which are, uh, which, uh, are hom homologous, okay? And you're taking the limit where they go to one, they approach one another, and you decompose in this configuration into uh, the individual uh, topological defect lines. And in particular, among this, uh, among this set is this di distinguished element, which we'll call one, that correspond to the identity line. Or correspond to the case there's no insertion at all, okay? And you're free to apply this to any, fuse this with any of the line over here, and you return, it will return to you the line that you started with. Another notion, is something that's already asked in the context of discrete symmetry that generalized beyond the fusion ring is the notion of topological junctions. Okay? The existence of topological junctions can be inferred from the topological property of these lines, but to specify these junctions individually requires additional data. Okay? So this, this topological junctions uh, are defined as follows. For any line, I call it L3, that appear in the fusion product between L1 and L2. So whenever I write the product of a line, it's interpreted as, in the sense, a fusion product, okay? For any line that appear in the fusion product, uh, you have a topological junction of this type. Generalizing the topological junction that we saw when these are lines that generate group-like symmetries. The junction relies on a specification, a specification of this, uh, uh, this, this point, okay? So you can be thought of a point operator, which I'll denote by V, okay? In general, when you specify the external topological defect line, there may be uh, multiple choice of V. And this V, in general, is a vector uh, in the vector space, which we'll call the junction vector space. Uh, topological junction vector space, to be precise, okay? And this topological junction vector space, because these are point-like operators, you can equivalently think about this as uh, kind of a TDL or topological defect line changing topological operators, okay? In particular, in a special case, uh, when you know L2 is identity, V will be the topological changing operator between the defect line L1 and L3. And in general, V will be the topological defect changing operator between the fusion product L1, L2, and L3. Okay? And uh, later, we'll give a more precise uh, kind of a, a picture for what this topological junction vector space is when we discuss this fragile defect lines in two-dimensional CFD, okay? Uh, the last ingredient to fully specify this notion of fusion category is uh, the notion of F symbols, okay? And this captures uh, possible general, uh, possible uh, factors you get from a topological change, a topology change in a network of topological defect lines. Similar to the phase that we encountered when we change a network of, uh, of part of the, you know, uh, the background uh, describing a, a part of the background for discrete symmetry, okay? So, uh, so this topological change is uh, commonly referred to as an F move, okay, which is the basic move to change the topology of, uh, of, the, of this kind of diagram uh, describing a two-dimensional uh, background for the discrete symmetry and also generalized to this uh, background of TDL network. Okay? 
So uh, I'm just redrawing the diagram we, we draw before, but in a different way. Okay. That's conventional uh, to, in convention to the literature. Okay. So one, two, three, four denotes uh, four topological defect lines. Okay. And A labels this internal topological defect line. Okay. And all these junctions are uh, topological junctions, so they're specific, specified implicitly by some specific vector uh, in this vector space. Okay. The F move corresponds to a topology change in this network by reconnecting uh, the second topological line to another leg. Okay, and in general, uh, some other intermediate uh, topological defect line may appear over here. And this change of basis is captured by some numerical coefficient known as the F symbol. Okay, so here, this, this, this thing can be thought of as a matrix. The one, two, three, four are external labels that uh, specify the external uh, lines that enter into this diagram. And this indices specify the change of basis between these two configurations, okay? So why do I think, why do I say this is a change of basis? Uh, what, I, what I mean precisely is that this is a change of basis in the junction vector space between four uh, external lines, L1, L2, L3, and L4, okay? So you think about uh, this pair of trivalent, trivalent vertices as a basis for the topological uh, junction between four external lines, okay? Because there are two ways to resolve this four-point junction. There, there are uh, uh, junctions, so there are two, that give you two preferred bases uh, for this space. And this F can matrix captures the change of basis. Sorry. This question? Uh, can you comment a bit about operational change of uh, this arrow? Because uh, uh, in sorry. the first picture, you, you, you draw the like, two, uh, two in go like in the vertex, you have two in going and one outgoing. But uh, in the other diagram, you have two outgoing and one in going. Sorry, which picture? Uh, well, like, for example, for this picture, like. Picture? Yeah, how important is it the two in going and one outgoing? Ah, so it's just because I want to make sense of this notation. So, so I can draw, I can draw an ingoing, and then it will be the L three bar. I'll come to back to that. Yeah. You, you will define what you mean by yes, bar. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, I think I can use this. Another space. question. Yes. Question. Can can you explain again why there's a whole vector space of uh, junctions? Uh, right. Um, so, so uh, okay, so, so it's not, uh, I think that notion is not completely clear at the moment, uh, but it's, you can think about this way. So uh, the point is that this is like a point-like operator, okay? So having one junction, you can, you can, you can multiply this point-like operator by arbitrary complex number. That's still topological. It's just a different way to define this junction. So if you have two independent uh, such junctions, then you have a, you know, a two-dimensional complex vector space. And that's one way to think about it. Later, we'll give a physical interpretation of how this junction vector space comes about in the two-dimensional CFT. It will be related to the Hilbert space of the two-dimensional CFT on a circle with defect points. Okay. And this will be, they will be characterized by specific states in that Hilbert space. It's, it's a subspace. We'll make that precise. But in order to define this F symbol, uh, why don't you need to specify the, uh, the junction? Very good, very good. So I cheated a bit. So he, as I, uh, I, I said it, but I didn't write it because it just makes the equation more complicated. So on the left-hand left -hand side, there's a choice of V1 and V2 over here. Oh, okay. okay. okay? And, and that on the right-hand side is also the choice of junction vectors here, V3 and V4. And this matrix will involve the stationary indices V1, V2, and V3, V4, and you're summing over all these choices. And for simplicity, I'm just drawing the case when the junction vector space are one-dimensional. Mm. Okay. 
so that the information is completely captured by this coefficient. Otherwise, there's a further, uh, further indices. Yeah. Is there some interesting case in which uh, the junction are always one dimensional or uh, uh, is a... Uh, so yes, yes, of course, yes. So okay. we'll come to that. For example, the, the duality defect, uh, which shows up in two-dimensional IC model as well as in this uh, three-dimensional and the four-dimensional gauge theories, uh, they all fall into this category uh, that having a, you know, one-dimensional junction vector space. Okay? As, as we'll explain, the dimensionality of this junction vector space will be tied to the, uh, the coefficient in the fusion ring when you write to the right-hand side in terms of indecomposable objects. Okay? And whenever the fusion product is such that only coefficient one shows up in the decomposition, that's the case, that, as we'll explain, that corresponds to the case when this is one dimensional. Okay, thanks for your questions. But I was just slightly jumping ahead, so if you don't understand that, did not understand that last comment, don't worry, we'll come to that. All right, so these F symbols are not arbitrary, okay? So they satisfy some consistency condition. Uh, some, this is something that you can already uh, kind of infer uh, from the fact that in, when you specialize the case when the defects are invertible, okay? This F symbol is nothing but the phase that we introduced before that captures the anomaly associated with the corresponding discrete group-like symmetry. Okay? And as we said before, the anomaly is subject, the anomalous phase is subject to this consistency condition that essentially tells you that it's a co-cycle. Okay? And that's where the group cohomology classification of the anomalies comes in. And here we can be more explicit and uh, recall what, where the consistency condition comes from. Okay? The consistency, will come from looking at a five-fold junction. So it's a topological junction involving uh, five external legs. Okay, so, uh, so uh, for simplicity, I'll now keep, keep track of the arrow, okay? Um, and then there are two internal legs labeled by A and B, okay? So this, this specify, if you once we specify the junction vector over here, this specify a particular junction in the space of, uh, you know, between five external lines, one, two, three, and four. Uh, sorry, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay? Now, there's a consecutive change of basis you can do. Okay, I'm, I think I was too ambitious with my space management. Uh, what I'm gonna draw will not fit in that region, so let me, let me move over here. Start with this diagram once again. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay, A and B. And as I said, this specifies a particular uh, a junction vector in this uh, junction vector space with uh, five external uh, TDLs specified. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And of course, there's various ways to resolve. So that you can think about this as specifying the, you know. Uh, Uh, one, two, three, four. The choice of junctions leaving here, okay? So this is what the, the so this is the general, general uh, junction, topological junction with five external legs, okay? And this, for any vector here, it's gonna be element inside this big vector space. Now there are different ways to represent vectors in this space uh, using, the topology, using the topological nature uh, of this, uh, uh, of this TDLs. So in other words, you can try to resolve this very singular looking junction into uh, like a triplet of a trivalent junction in this picture, okay? And each different resolution will give you a different basis, okay, for this uh, junction vector space by considering arbitrary choice of internal legs over here and arbitrary, arbitrary choice of uh, junction vertex, junction vectors at these uh, threefold junctions, okay? And there's a consistency coming from uh, uh, comparing this to the following, okay? So, so let, me, let me draw it over here. So this is the famous Pentagon equation. We can perform this change of basis given by this F move, okay? From this basis to this basis, okay? 
by using this F matrix. Okay, and then we can do it multiple times. Okay, now do the F move focusing on this part. Okay, and you get to this picture. And we can do it again. Okay. Focusing on this part. And apply the same F move, and we get to this picture. Of course, there will be different, uh, different coefficient or different matrices that enter into each step. Uh, correspond to a different labeling of the external labels as well as the choice of internal lines that appear in that channel, okay? But then the point is that going through this round, we establish the change of basis between this basis for the five-fold junction vector space and this basis for the five-fold junction vector space, okay? But there's a different way to reach the same change of basis uh, matrix is to do first uh, this picture, okay, which correspond to doing uh, F move on this block. Okay, so you reconnect three with this uh, other side of this diagram. And then do F move on this region and you get to this basis again. And in this process, another different, uh, the same F, F matrix with again with different external indices shows up. And by consistency, because you're just discuss, you're discussing change of basis between, uh, between two sp special bases in two different ways, you must get the same result that schematically look like a product of three F matrices with certain indices that's been contracted is equal to the product of two F matrices going this way, okay? And this is the famous uh, Pentagon equation because this looks like a pentagon. Uh, which is a generalization the co-cycle condition for G symmetry, okay? For invertible symmetry where G is discrete. And in which case, the Pentagon equation is the same as the co-cycle condition that defines the G anomaly. Okay? So now we have introduced all the basic ingredients that define what is known as the fusion category. Okay? So it's not something mysterious. It's just some objects that uh, generalize groups and knows about the anomaly associated with groups to the case where the building uh, topological defects are non-invertible. Oops, okay, I'll pick it up later. Together, so that was saying, the topological defect lines, their fusion, junctions, so these are individual building blocks for this uh, underlying structure and F symbols. They lead to the fusion category. The structure of a fusion category, okay? So this is just some references in case you, uh, you have heard about the category before and you want to make connection to the notion of category in this language. In this case, the underlying objects for the fusion category are the topological defect lines. The fusion will describe uh, the tensor product Uh, between these objects in this fusion category. The fusion category has, in particular, a structure of a tensor product. And these junctions lead to morphisms between objects in the fusion category, and in particular, between objects and their tensor products, okay? And this is why the trivalent junction, okay, defines a morphism, okay? And these F symbols are known as associators which specifies isomorphisms between uh, the tensor product of three objects. Okay. okay. So 
that actually has six, uh, six uh, external uh, labels, and that's why it's called a, uh, also called a 6J symbol. Okay. And this fusion category structure, as we already saw uh, from various uh, parts of this uh, structure, it generalizes This will discrete a group symmetry, okay? In particular, in a special case, when all the topological defect lines are invertible and corresponding to some group, the fusion category is nothing but the usual discrete group symmetry, but at the same time, keeping track of the anomaly through the F symbol. So it's, it's in a sense, more, uh, more kind of contain more data than the group, but the data it contains is precisely what we're, we care about in physics. They're an anomaly associated with the discrete symmetry. And the second comment is that the structure of a fusion category is extremely constraining. Okay. Of course, if you, insist, if you don't uh, introduce this uh, uh, non invertible defects, then it's just as constraining as it is for constraining anomalies for, uh, associated with a given group symmetry, okay? But here, the constraints manifest in the following uh, way. Let me just give you an example. If you start from a set of topological defect lines which, which you postulate that describe some fusion category symmetry, and you postulate the fusion rule, okay? For example, if you, uh, if you just postulate a single topological defect, and you postul postulate the fusion rule of the form uh, L squared uh, is equal to one, the, which is a trivial defect, plus N, which is some degeneracy, times uh, L itself, okay? This is only gives a fusion category for N equal to zero or one, okay? So this, this is very surprising because uh, why can't we have a, a, a single non-invertible defect that satisfies such a fusion rule, okay? And the constraint is coming from the F-symbols and in particular the Pentagon equation that uh, constrain the F-symbol. And the punchline is that when the N is, uh, so the, the story is that when N is large enough, uh, there's just no solution to the, to the Pentagon equations, okay? And as we'll later we'll see, all this structure of fusion category symmetry would necessarily comes out from the locality of a quantum field theory. So that tells you that this symmetry is just simply not possible in the quantum field theory. Okay? So there are question. Yes. So does this constraint come from a unitarity or it's independent of unitarity? Uh, this, this statement is independent of unitarity. Uh, it's just, well, okay. So I mean, let, me, let me start, start. It depends on how unitary you want the theory to be. Uh, so to be, to be absolutely sure, uh, I think we're impl implicitly assuming some notion of unitarity because if we forget about unitarity, then, uh, then for example, the fusion products may have uh, funny coefficients and that would ruin this story. But, but here, uh, the fact that we're talking about the fusion category actually uh, relies on some notion of unitarity. That's a very good question. Yes. Okay, Otherwise, there's this general notion of some pseudo fusion category. Um, very good question. Uh, so, sorry, when, when you look at the solution of the Pentagon equation, um, yeah. in, in which range do you look uh, for, for F? Should it be a phase, uh, there should be, there is some condition? Very good, very good question, so, so uh, very good question, very good question. So as I, as I, as I mentioned briefly over here, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, for each junction vector, there's, a, there's ambiguity, right? Even if the junction vector space is one dimensional, you have an ambiguity coming from the context number. And if you, if you uh, in, keep track of an ambiguity in this equation, you see that depending on your choice of normalization of this vertex here and here, okay, that will change the F matrix, okay? So, uh, so in general, the F, this F symbol is not uh, completely unambiguous, okay? But a statement here is that there's just absolutely no solution, whatever uh, choice of normalization you take for the vertices. But in general, you will have family of solution for the F symbols, but we only study them up to this equivalence relation. And that is, that is the analog of the, you know, the uh, exact uh, co-cycles in the context of a uh, group cohomology. So the, 
the phase coming from the F move for the uh, group, group symmetry case, okay? That's subject to ambiguities coming from the exact co-cycles. And that is uh, the physical origin of that uh, is coming from the redefinition of these uh, point-like operators. Okay. All right. And another comment I want to make over here is that uh, just like in the case of groups, right, there are ways to classify groups, and, and that, has, that is known. Okay? So you may ask if there's a classification of these uh, fusion category symmetries. And the answer is that mathematicians are still working on that. And there's no classification as of yet, uh, except for low-rank cases. Rank means the number of uh, indecomposable objects, which we'll come to shortly. Okay. But on the other hand, from physics, as we'll see, we'll be able to produce tons of tons of examples for the fusion categories. Okay. So it's really... Uh, down to the mathematicians to actually uh, pursue a classification that would, uh, you know, include all the examples we cook up. And lastly, it's related to the question, uh, is uh, there's some structure associated to the uh, Pentagon, uh, Pentagon equation, okay? That is up to this gauge freedom that we have associated with redefining each point-like operator that live at the junction, there's topological point-like operators, okay? The Pentagon solutions, the Pentagon equations uh, have only discrete solutions. Okay? So again, this is up to the gauge freedom that we talked about in redefining these junctions. Okay, and this is very nice. Uh, mathematically, this is known as the Oknienu uh, rigidity. Okay, this is something that the mathematician, mathematician had proved. Okay, so it says that the Pentagon equation does not allow continuous family of solutions when you uh, when you remove the potential continuous uh, ambiguities coming from this uh, this redefinitions. Okay, and this is very nice because this is the similar feature that we have for anomalies. Okay, anomalies are quantized and they cannot change under continuous deformations. And because of this feature, they are bound to make non-trivial constraints on quantum field theories, okay? In particular for RG flows, which is a continuous process. Okay? So that is the mathematical framework underlies this non-invertible symmetry in two dimensions. Okay. We have not really put in any physics. As we as we'll see, studying these symmetries in the context of two-dimensional quantum field theories would make of some of, make many of the structures uh, more transparent, and it will also lead to additional uh, physical information, uh, which is not obvious at all from these basic building blocks. Ivan, just uh, in There's principle, in two minutes, we should move to the discussion, but uh, maybe you got a lot of questions, so you can take a little bit more if you want. Oh, uh, how much? This is already, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, if I can have, uh, it can have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, I think uh, that's okay. good, yeah. All right. So there's some extra structures. Uh, let me, let me explain coming from uh, studying the symmetry in two-dimensional QFT, okay? With this uh, non-invertible symmetry. Okay? So to be explicit, uh, we'll restrict to uh, 2D CFTs. We'll discuss the symmetry in the context of 2D CFT. And this is not really a loss of generality because 
uh, as we alluded to over here, the structure of the friction category is rigid. So to the QFTs that's obtained from CFTs by RG flows, it's naturally captured by the statement we'll be making here, okay? But the, the CFT or TQFT, which is a special case of a CFT, okay? And, but the notion of a 2D CFT will help me to make uh, some explicit statements uh, using, uh, so, so this is convenient because we'll be able to use uh, radio quantization And as we'll see shortly, uh, they will help me to specify what these uh, operators are in radio quantization, okay? Uh, because in this case, in the CFT, I have radio quantization. On top of that, uh, I have well-defined uh, eigenvalues for the L0 and L0 bar generators for the conformal symmetry, and they are H bar and H, okay? This is the only really, really uh, where I'm using the CFT structure. Okay, all right, and the key, uh, as I already mentioned, coming, the coming uh, that leads to this extra structure in CFT for this fusion category symmetry is the locality, okay? And this is something true for general quantum field theory, which can be thought of as consistency in cutting and gluing uh, CFT or quantum field theory finding function with observables, okay? So you can cut and glue, cut your, your observable pattern function with observable in different ways and glue them back together, it will lead to the same results, okay? That's, the, uh, that's one notion of locality, okay? One way to phrase the notion of locality. And as we'll see, this locality will lead to this uh, fusion category structure starting from the basic objects, the topological defects, okay? All the others will just follow. First of all, so we start from the topological defects, which we postulate is, uh, as a symmetry in the theory, okay? The topological defects X on local operators, okay? And we can be quite precise in the context of two-dimensional CFT. So imagine you have a local operator over here, okay? As I said before, the way a unitary operator acts on the local operator is by enclosing it, okay? And because this operator is topological, it means that in particular it commutes with a stress tensor, okay? So it will preserve the conformal weight associated with this local operator, and it will produce another operator, which I'll denote by L hat acting on operator phi, okay? This operator with the same, same H, H bar as the original operator before you act by, by the topological defect. And uh, moreover, this also implies that the topological defects will map Virasoro primaries in the two-dimensional CFT to Virasoro primaries, and it will map the entire multiplets to multiplets. Okay? And equivalently, from the radio quantization, uh, you can think about this picture as meaning on the cylinder, where on the bottom of cylinder, you insert the corresponding state correspond to this local operator. So it's a primary operator, okay? And this is a state inside the Hubert space on S1. And this is the line insertion, okay? That acts on this Hubert space that correspond to, that comes from this, uh, this uh, radial mapping, okay? The coordinate change that you use in the radial quantization. And this is the, this is the equivalent meaning that tells you how, you know, uh, this, this is why uh, uh, we use the L hat because L hat can be also thought of as the operation of this uh, symmetry defect act acting on the states, okay? So this is the, if you wish, this is the generalization of what Wigner wrote for unitaries, but now for this uh, more general operation, linear operation, L hat. So I just introduced the last, uh, another ingredient, and and with questions, okay. The other important ingredient coming from the, the quantum field theory in the presence of these topological defects is the defect Hubert space. And this is, this is the consequence of the locality of these topological defects, okay. And this is the generalized notion 
of the twisted sector of a two-dimensional CFT that you associate with, with uh, discrete symmetries. Okay? The idea is that you study, again, the theory on the cylinder, but you can choose uh, to align the, the topological defect now in the time direction. In which case, the Hubert space gets deformed, and the general state inside the Hubert space, uh, I'll denote it by psi, the Hubert space just gets deformed, okay, into this twisted Hubert space. In a special case when it's L correspond to a group-like symmetry defect, this is nothing but the twisted, the, bond, the Hubert space with the twisted boundary condition imposed on the spatial circle. But in the case of a non irreducible defect, because of locality, you can still define this uh, defect Hubert space. And by uh, the, uh, the same conformal map that relates the video quantization to the cylinder, uh, this is equivalent to specifying this operator is equivalent, sorry, specifi specifying this state is equivalent to having a local operator that sits at the end of a uh, topological defect line. And once again, uh, because of the uh, topological nature of these lines, this again falls into representations of the two copies of your Sorrow symmetry. Okay? And in particular, uh, we'll assume the following condition which is a, a physical assumption. Let me call it uh, the tadpole condition. That is only the identity line can end topologically. And this is this is uh, this is equivalent to having a faithful representation of the symmetry in this case the non-invertible symmetry generated by the subordinate defect on the Hilbert space on S one. Okay. The reason is that if other topological defects can end topologically on operators, so in this case psi in general is an operator with h and h bar that's not equal to zero comma zero. Okay, so it's not so in the case of a topological junction, it will be the special case when h bar equal to zero, okay? But in general, this is not possible. And indeed, for, for CFTs, uh, we want to impose the condition that the, this, this, uh, this is always not possible. Uh, as, uh, so having h and h bar equal to zero for psi, it's always impossible uh, when the topological defect line is not an NC. And that, that's the equivalent to requiring the symmetry that you, uh, that you, you are studying to be uh, represented faithfully on this Hubert space. Okay. Um, I think I'm running out of time, right? So maybe let me stop here and uh, answer questions and we'll catch up next lecture. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Recording stopped. And uh, before.